Good morning, Metro. So uh, today I have the privilege and honor to preach on uh, Doctor Strange, uh, Multiverse of Madness. Um, so we're taking a break from the community series. So this sermon may or may not be related to community. So don't be, uh, don't be uh, you know, taking it back. But anyways, uh, let me quickly summarize this movie for us. So um, this movie starts off with Doctor Strange and a new character named America Chavez. They're running away from something or someone. We don't know yet. But they're running away from something and someone, and uh, long story short, it's because this something or someone is trying to kill America Chavez for her powers. Uh, now, America Chavez, she's a very unique character because she has a unique power. So her superpower is that she is able to travel the multiverse. Some of you don't know what a multiverse is. It means multiple universes, all right? That's literally what it is, a multiple universe. So let me give you an example, all right? So I'm Pastor IJ, I'm a pastor, but in some other universe, I might be a glob that's a model. It, 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 I know, some of you are like, that makes no sense. That's the multiverse. Anything's possible. I could, there's just different variations of me. That is the multiverse, all right? So there's different realities, different universes of anything and anyone. That is the multiverse, that's what the movie is about, all right? So America Chavez, she can do that just with her own power. And usually in the Marvel universe, you need some kind of technology, you need a, a, a team of like extremely smart people, you need like these little stones that are super powerful called infinity stones, like you need something to travel it, but America Chavez, she could just do it by herself. That's why she's unique, all right? So they're running away for something and someone and shock, there's a shocking turn of events. The person that's trying to kill her and take her power is actually Wanda Maximoff, also known as Scarlet Witch. And the reason that's such a shocker is because Scarlet Witch is actually an Avenger. And if you don't know what the Avenger is, you live under a rock, no, I'm just playing. But uh, she's an Avenger, and an Avenger is like the good guys. They're the, they're the superheroes, you know? They're supposed to be saving people. So why is Scarlet Witch trying to kill America Chavez? It's because Scarlet Witch, she wants to be in a world where she's happy. She wants to be in a world where she has her two sons, Billy and Tommy. She is willing to destroy the multiverse and America Chavez just so she can have happiness, her dreams of what could have been. Now, similar to Scarlet Witch, there's someone in the Bible that has suffered tremendous amount of loss as well, and his name is Job. And I wanna take us uh, um, into a background story of who Job is and what did he have. So who is Job? I won't read it for us, but Job chapter one, verse eight, Job is a blameless man. We know this because God himself actually deems Job a blameless man. What did he have? Job chapter one, verse two to three, Job was very blessed. Job had seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and held the title, was the greatest of all the people of the East. He had a lot but Job lost it all. Throughout the story of Job, we realize, oh, he's lost a lot. He lost his oxen, he lost his sheep, he lost his camels, he lost his children, he lost his health, and he lost the support of his spouse. I mean, for those of you that are married, imagine you went through what Job did and your spouse is like, hey, you should curse God and die. You know, <laughs> like, he lost a lot, and he's going through a tremendous amount of grief. Have you gone through a loss in your life and you didn't get over it? Have you gone through a loss so tragic like the Scarlet Witch? You were willing to destroy the lives of people around you and you let grief consume you. Or maybe some of you relate more to Job where you, you feel like, man, I'm not a bad person. You know, we're all sinners, but I go to church. I do the right thing. Why is this all happening to me? Why am I losing so much? What did I do to deserve this? Although Scarlet Witch and Job have experienced tremendous amount of loss, uh, grief for God's people, it's not the end of the story. Not even death is the end of the story. For God's people, grief actually points to something greater than itself. Grief points to grace. And that is what I wanna preach on today, is that grief points to grace. And how exactly does grief point to grace? I'm gonna walk us through. But before I do so, please turn with me to Job chapter 42, verses one to six. Job chapter 42, verses one to six. I'm gonna be reading from the ESV. So it's Job chapter 42, verses one to six. 
This is what it says. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is the word of our Lord. Uh, all right, um, let me pray for us. Um, God of grace, mercy, and love, thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, many of us have experienced deep loss, and we are in grief. We are living in a world, God, where it's overflowing with grief. But God, you are the God who is there for us, who cares for us. You are the God who is the beginning and the end. And we know as your people, Lord, we hold on to this truth that grief is not the end of the story. That for your people, grief actually points to something greater than itself. That grief points to grace. So Lord, take us through your word, take us deeper into your heart, and help us to see how exactly does grief point to grace. Thank you, and I pray in Son's name, amen. So as I said before, today's sermon is about grief pointing to grace. I'm going to walk us through how. How does grief point to grace? There's three ways that grief points to grace. So the first one, grief points to grace through godly sorrow. Say godly sorrow. So Scarlet Witch. Uh, if you're like me, I was like, this girl's crazy. Uh, it's very crazy. Wanting to kill trillions of people just for two kids. But that's not all that she lost. She actually lost a lot more. And I want to take, us, uh, I want to take you through her backstory just for us to empathize with her. Um, so Scarlet Witch, or she's also known as w Wanda Maximoff, she actually lost her family. She lost her parents in Sokovia. She lost her community and culture. She lost her brother trying to fight for the world. She lost her lover, Vision. She lost her could-be kids. But most importantly, she lost her identity as Wanda Maximoff. She was a person before she was a Scarlet Witch, but she lost it all. And as sad as her loss was, Scarlet Witch is processing her grief through worldly sorrow. And I wanna give us a distinction. What is the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow? So worldly sorrow, it's Actually, not letting others into our pain. It's relying on yourself. The reason I say this is because the Scarlet Witch in the Marvel Universe, she's actually one of the most powerful beings, like, ever. She can live in a universe where her kids are with her, and she can live in a universe where she is happy. But that comes at the cost of trillions. She's processing her grief through worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow, on the other hand, it's actually inviting others into our pain. Godly sorrow is inviting God into our pain. You see, even though the Scarlet Witch, she can do these things, she didn't have to. Like I said, she was part of the Avengers. And if you were keeping up with the Marvel movies, in the team of Avengers, they all lost. They all were processing grief. She didn't have to process it by herself but she chose to. However, as Christians, we are to process our grief through godly sorrow. And I wanna take us to Job chapter two, 11 to 13 to see what exactly is godly sorrow. So Job chapter two, 11 to 13, this is what it says. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was great. I'm going to say that one more time. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. I know for Christians, so many of us, when we encounter grief, when we encounter suffering, when we encounter anything that's not of God, we're so tempted to give a textbook answer. Pastor Peter just walked us through. There were many mass shootings in the past two weekends. And so quickly as Christians, I think we're easy to be like, hey, but you know, God's a good God. 
You know, thanks a lot, Sherlock Holmes, but right now, our world is grieving. Godly sorrow, it's inviting people into your pain. And for those of you that are invited into pain, it sometimes means you just sit there in that pain. Just like Job's friends, sometimes you don't say a word and you just sit in that pain. Grief, it points to grace through godly sorrow. Who are you inviting into your pain? Some of you, your grief is consuming you because you're t carrying this burden all by yourself. You think you can do it, and I, I'm pretty sure many of you can do it. You know, we live in Burn County, you're all very successful. We live in a wealthy neighborhood, we're resourceful. You can do these things, but you don't have to. Grief points to grace through godly sorrow. Second point, grief points to grace through grappling with God. Say grappling with God. So you see, the second character I want us to hone on in is Dr. Strange. Uh, Dr. Strange, he grapples with realities. And what I mean by this is America Chavez and Dr. Strange, they're going through all these different universes because they're trying to find a way to put down Scarlet Witch, all right? They're trying to find a way, like, how do we beat her? So they're going through all of these different universes. And although all these different universes are very different from one another, there are two things about Doctor Strange throughout all these universes that stay the same, all right? The first one is he realizes, wow, I'm a jerk in every universe. <laughs> like, in every universe, he is such a jerk. I used another word in sermon prep, but they told me not to use it. But anyways, he's such a jerk. Like in every universe, in every single universe, it's always, I know what to do. I'm going to fix the issue. But then, in a lot of these universes, he makes the right call to defeat evil, but it also comes at the cost of trillions. <laughs> so it's like, you're no different from Scarlet Witch, bro. So in every universe, he realizes, oh my gosh, I'm no better than this girl, Scarlet Witch. And then the second thing that he realizes throughout all these universes is he never gets the girl. He's actually not happy. So uh, the girl, it, her name is Christine, and um, she is played by Rachel McAdams. Yo, shout out to Rachel McAdams if you're watching this. You know, number one fan. But anyways, <laughs> if you're watching this, I'm a fan. But anyways, um, anyways, so in every reality, he's like, he's not happy. He doesn't get the girl. It's so sad. But as he, throughout the movie, he's grappling with these realities, like, oh my gosh, like, wow, I'm not happy, I don't get the girl, I'm a jerk. But throughout these movies, as he's grappling with reality, you know, at the end of it, he makes the right call. And when I mean the right call, instead of his, um, what he would usually do is making the right call in his mind, um, and like sacrificing trillions of people to do the right thing, what he ends up doing at the end of the movie, he actually empowers other people. Instead of him making the decision, he tells America Chavez, you can do this. You can actually save the day. And you see, Doctor Strange would not have made the right call if he didn't grapple with different realities of himself. If he never realized, wow, in every reality I'm a jerk, I think he would have just replayed it and done a jerk move. But he actually decides to do the right thing, the humble thing, and he tells America Chavez, you can do it, not me, you can do it. In a similar way, as Dr. Strange is grappling with different realities, we see in the Bible, Job grapples with God. I'm not gonna read it for us because it's a lot, but in Job chapter three, verse three to four, Job starts off in his despair. He says something like, let the day perish on which I was born. And then, later in Job 31, 35, he says, let the Almighty answer me. He's grappling with God. He's in a place where he's like, oh, I'm in so much sorrow, and all of a sudden he's like, hey you, come here. He's like going up and down, up and down. What does this mean? Does this mean we get to be sassy with God? Yes and no. Yes, you can bring your real and raw emotions before God. He is so much bigger than that. If a righteous and blameless man like Job is able to do that, how much more are you and I able to do as sons and daughters of God? 
You can bring your real and raw emotions before God. However, as you grapple with God, just know that God will grapple with you. We see in Job 38 verses 3 to 4, God actually engages with Job. He answers Job after 30 chapters of Job asking God, what is going on? Hey, you come down here. You know, I'm perishing. As he's grappling with God, God grapples with Job. Look at verse, uh, chapter 38, verse three to four. It says, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you have understanding. Job chapter 39, verse one. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? I'm going to be honest with you. When I read that, I was like, what? (laughs) I was like, God, this man's suffering, and you're going to talk about mountain goats and does? But what's actually going on here is as Job is grappling with God, God is engaging with Job. He's responding to Job. What he's telling Job is, hey, from the cosmic to the creaturely, I love you. From the cosmic before the earth's foundation was even laid, to the mountain goats giving birth, which none of y'all care about, but God is saying, I do, because I'm the God of grace, mercy, and love, and I love you. God's rebuke to Job, it's not because Job was a filthy man or evil, but it's because Job was forgetting who God is and his love for him. Many of us, when we are going through grief, we forget who God is. Many of us, when we go through through grief, we forget that God loves us. But even in your grief, grapple with God because God will grapple with you and remind you over and over again, I am the God of the universe and I love you. And it's only, only after Job grapples with God is he able to come to a place of grace where he says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, this is Job chapter 42, one to six. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Not only can you bring your real and raw emotions before God, but God will come before you, church. Sometimes God might rebuke you. Sometimes God might be silent. But always God is reminding you of who he is and his love for you. I'm not saying grappling with God is easy. I've been there and I'm continually doing that. Um, Some of you, if you've been coming to Metro for a while, you know my story, but I'll I'll give a quick summary about um, a little testimony about my relation with my dad. So growing up, my relation with my dad was not a good relationship. Um, It wasn't until years well into, like, you know, uh, my adult years, I realized, oh, that was something called abuse. After going through counselors and therapists, they're like, you know, IJ, you can name it for what it was. He, your dad abused you. Not only was it physically and verbally, but spiritually. Um, my dad, he's a, he's a pastor. He's a Korean pastor. So you could realize how difficult it was for me on Sundays. How do you preach the word of God? But on the weekdays, how do you destroy your kid's self-worth? Uh, by the grace of God, um, I'm just giving you a, a, a recap, but by the grace of God, you know, my dad and I, we've reconciled throughout the years. We have a restored relationship and a restoring relationship. Um, but I remember two years ago, I was living with Pastor Peter, and I was just sharing, like, the nitty-gritty of my testimony. And um, in response, he said, you know, Ajay, were you able to forgive your mom? And I don't know what it was about that question, but I just started bawling. I had, no, I had all these mixed emotions. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know what to think, but it struck a chord with me. And I remember two weeks after Pastor Peter brought that up, I met him with my sister. We were just catching up on life. And um, I was like, you know, like I was living with Pastor Peter. He said something weird, like, did I forgive mom? Like, it's like, it's like some weird question. My sister just started bawling out of nowhere. We were in a cafe, a cuppy in Edgewater. Like, do you know how awkward it is for me? Like, 
like, I'm like, why is she crying? And like, everyone's like looking at me like I'm the abusive boyfriend. You know what I mean? I'm like, no, we're siblings. They're like, that's even worse. You know, I'm like, no, no. Like, I'm like, what's going on? But she's just bawling her eyes out. I was like, hey, like, why are you, why are you crying? Like, what's going on? She's like, you know, I'm so glad Pastor Peter brought that up to you because I always wanted to share this with you. I didn't know how to bring it up, but I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because throughout all those years, I knew Appa hurt you so bad, but I always chose Samuel, my younger brother, over you. I never wanted him to see and experience such violence, so I always took him to another room, and I always chose Samuel over you. More recently, I uh, got to have a conversation with my mom. I had a conversation with my mom, and, um, you know, she was just reminiscing about uh, us growing up, and um, now that I'm in a more uh, different stage of my life, and as I'm, you know, planning for the future in a committed relationship, you know, going on to the next stage of life, you know, she was just apologizing, man, I really missed out on so much of your life. Uh, she was working two to three jobs when we were growing up, and she didn't really get to come out to any of my events. Um, any, like, school plays, any, like, marching band events, any, like, soccer tournaments. So, like, she never really got to uh, make it to that. And she's like, you know, I really lost a lot of time. Um, you know, it got silent, and I told my mom, like, hey, Oma, like, I, I understood. I understood why you weren't there. You know, you had to provide for us. But I was always curious, how come you never stopped Appa from hurting me? How come you never did anything? How come you never protected me? And she was just filled with tears. She had nothing to say, but I'm, I'm so sorry. And the reason I share all this with you is because I had to grapple with God. God, you're a good God. Why me? God, you're the good God, but... You know, my own mom didn't protect me. All you see is like a finished product here, but you have no idea how many demons I had to wrestle through. None of y'all have any idea how many years the insecurities I had to grapple with. Like how messed up was I, God, that my own mom didn't protect me? You know, if my family didn't protect me, like who would? If my family didn't love me, who would? If my family did not choose me, who would? But I was, as I was grappling with God throughout those years, there was not like a magical moment in my life. It's not like God had like, there wasn't like this wondrous moment. But it was through years of just grappling with God, I was sharing this with one of my soulmates. And as he was just weeping for me, you know, he just pointed out, you know, IJ, even when your mom and sister didn't protect you, even when you felt so alone, even when you felt like you couldn't share this with anyone, God was there in those moments. And he walked me through a prayer asking Jesus, Jesus, can you show me all those moments where I felt like no one was there? Can you show me that you were there for me? God reminded me of his love God reminded me of who he is. God reminded me by saying, I love you. I am there for you. Some of you have had deep loss. Some of you have a deep loss of a life that should have been. I know for youth group and college students, because of COVID, you had a deep loss of those years you'll never get back. Some of you, especially, I'm, you know, especially for my single folks out there, a deep loss that we have are life milestones that we couldn't accomplish yet according to our timeline. Some of you, for parents, 
you have a deep loss of that dream child or a family that you desired or you thought you would have, but it's nothing like you imagined. Wherever you are in life, whatever kind of loss or grief you have, I want to encourage you, bring your raw emotions before God and grapple with him because God will engage with you. God is not a vending machine. He's not some Amazon Prime. He's not something where you say, hey God, if I do this, you give me that. But he's a God of relationship. And all the things that you go through, none of it might make sense in the moment. But I want to encourage you to hold on and grapple with God. Because I promise you, in those moments, as you grapple with God, you'll realize, looking back, that all moments point to his grace. Your grief, it points to grace. But you need to grapple with God. And lastly, your grief points to grace through a grateful heart. The last character in the Doctor Strange movie that I want to point out is America Chavez. America Chavez, as I said before, she, her superpower is that she can travel through the multiverse. But the I issue is that she can't control her powers. She can't control her powers. And the reason she can't control her powers is because when she was a kid, when America Chavez was a kid, she got so scared, she misused her powers, and then she ended up sending her parents to a completely another universe. And ever since then, they've been separated. For all we know, her parents could be dead. So for America Chavez, she was just living in this life of shame, a life of fear, like, oh, it's all my fault. I shouldn't be alive. Why did I do this? And like America Chavez, some of you, that's what your grief is doing to you. You're filled with shame. You're filled with fear. I lost this. I don't know how I can live on. I'm so scared of life. But I want to encourage you that your grief, don't let it consume you. There's something greater than your grief. And later on in the film, America Chavez, she actually learns to have a grateful life, a life of gratitude. And it's actually through that acknowledgement of a life of gratitude, that's actually how she defeats the Scarlet Witch. People think that she defeats the Scarlet Witch with this amazing superpower, or she like kills her before Scarlet Witch kills her. But that's not what happens. America Chavez, she actually sends Scarlet Witch to another universe where her kids are loved and are happy. And it's in that moment Scarlet Witch lets go. Like America Chavez, Job's story does not end with grief, but a grateful heart. I'm going to read for us Job chapter 42, verse 10. It says this, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. I want, I want to make it clear, God isn't rewarding Job for his suffering. He's not like, wow, you did such a good job. Let me give you two times the things that I took away from you. That's not what God is doing. But the point of Job's fortunes being doubled is to show that whether Job is in a loss or whether Job is in blessings, that Job is thankful to the giver and taker of life. Job's fortunes weren't doubled because that's what, that was a point of his grief. But that in his blessings, Job still believes and worships God. Amen. You see the fortunes being doubled, that is just a side reward. That is just a side benefit. The main thing is that Job gets deeper with God. He worships the giver and taker of life. Job's grief it points to something further than itself, something greater than itself. Job's grief points to God's grace. You see, for me and my family, that's not the end of our story. And our story is continually being written. My family, you know, we are so grateful for those moments. Looking back, we're grateful for those moments. I mean, when we were in those moments, it was hard. It was so hard. But now that we're in this place in our lives, 
where we have grown, where we've matured, where we've come to a place of reconciliation and restoration, we are thankful for God. Not only do we have double the portions of our family's finances being blessed, of us being closer to one another, that's just a side benefit, but we are so grateful because all of our relationships with God has deepened further that our grief was not the end-all, be-all, but it pointed to a greater grace. And actually, next month, I don't know if some of y'all know, but um, I got my ordination ceremony all the way in Missouri. But um, yeah, it's all the way in Missouri. I don't know why Missouri, but anyways. um, But, you know, my family, they're all coming out to see me. They're all coming out to celebrate me. They are all coming out to be there for me. I could have walked away from my family and my faith and I could choose a different life that I have now. All of you, you can walk away from your faith. You can walk away from God. That's a choice you have. But I want to encourage you as the people of God, don't let your grief consume you. Don't let your grief overtake you. Let your grief point to grace. Invite others into your pain through godly sorrow. As you go through godly sorrow, as you go through grappling with God, that you may have such a grateful heart and that, and that your grateful heart can point to a greater grace. And I pray, church, that as we live in a grief-stricken world, that this will not be the end all be all, but that you may go deeper with the God who loves you day in and day out. The God who is the God of grace, mercy, and love. Let's pray. Man, at this time, um, I don't, I don't know what our church members are going through specifically, but I feel such a heavy heart in our church, a grief-filled heart in our church. And I just want to invite you all to come before God. Bring your grief before God. Some of you are just so sick of all the evil that's going on in this world that you're numb to it. There's so many mass shootings going on. But if you're one of those people that are feeling numb because of your grief, I wanna invite you before before God, come before God. Allow God to minister to your soul. There's a lot of racial violence that's been highlighted by the media, some rightfully so. But as Christians, what we do with this grief is not that we go out and hurt other people, nor is it to be ignorant and become numb to it. But can we come before God with our grief? Lay it down before God. from the macro of things, whether it's like mass killings or racial violences, to the micro of things, to the more personal of things, bring it before God. Some of us are wrestling with so much pain and grief, but we just brush it to the side. This is not oppression Olympics. We are not comparing pain with one another. But I want to invite you, no matter how great or small your grief is, can you please bring it before the Lord? I want to give our church a minute to just come and pray before God.
God of grace, mercy, and love, what do we do with such grief and pain? We are a hurting church, living in a hurting world. But God, as your people, we choose to see that grief is not the end of the story. So Lord, in our grief and pain, help us to see you. Let all, because we believe all things point to you, but some of us, it's hard to see that. It's really difficult. But Lord, minister to us. Help us to see you through the darkest times. May we not be consumed by our grief. Thank you, God. And I pray in Son's name, amen.